Even, even members, um, before I introduce our speaker, I was asked just to give a uh, slight information about uh, the project that I'm involved in and the reason why we're having to talk on Andrew Bonner Law tonight. So um, I'm also chairman of the Andrew Bonner Law Memorial Project and a small group of us felt it was fitting that in the 100th anniversary of uh, 100th anniversary year of Andrew Boner Law becoming Prime Minister, that it would be fitting to do something in the Korean area, which he had a strong local connection to, uh, to recognise that connection. So um, we decided that we would commission a bust of Andrew Boner Law, um, which will be on field this Saturday at 2pm in Korean Town Hall. And any members who would like to come along on the day, you'd be more than welcome to come along. Um, it has been a project that has been in the making for um, well over a year now to uh, get the design and we're still fundraising. One of the efforts we're doing, and I know Amory has sent emails out about both the event on Saturday and also about the fundraising efforts that we are currently undertaking. Um, and one of the things that we're currently uh, selling is a mini bust of Andrew Boner Law uh, as part of the fundraising projects. Uh, and this is a replica of the full-size bus that will go in place in Korean Town Hall. Um, and it would be, a, coming up to Christmas, it might be a, a great idea to, uh, for a gift. Um, we have a website which you can uh, purchase the um, bus from and then it will be delivered out to you. So I'd like to introduce our speaker um, tonight. We're very lucky to have Professor Graham Walker, who is the Emirates Professor of Political History at Queen's University Belfast. He has published extensively, uh, extensively in subject areas of British and Irish history and politics, and is the author of political biographies and studies of political parties, including a uh, history of the Ulster Unionist Party uh, based here in Northern Ireland. He is the joint author of a forthcoming book on Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Union. Tonight, uh, our talk will assess the political career of Andrew Boner Law, who became Prime Minister exactly 100 years ago this week in 1922. It will also concern with his family connection to Ulster and his passionate interventions in the Irish home rule controversies of the years preceding the First World War. So I'd like now to hand over to Professor Graham Walker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you for the invitation to talk to your group. Um, Thank you all for, for joining in the, the Zoom link up tonight. Um, yes, as Aaron was saying there in his introduction, uh, we're almost a century on from Andrew Boner Law becoming Prime Minister. And it's still up until now the shortest premiership of the post of, of, of the past century. But maybe later this week, that distinction will be handed over to somebody else. Uh, namely Liz Truss. So we'll, we'll have to watch that one, uh, but it is in some ways a bit of a coincidence. Um, Andrew Bonner Law is known as the, or, or it is often called the unknown prime minister or the forgotten prime minister. And I think this is understandable given the brevet, brevity of his uh, premiership. But uh, Bonner Law's political career should certainly not be forgotten. It's a fascinating story, and he has left an important legacy, certainly in the form of Northern Ireland, uh, where we are living today, or most of us. Um, Bonner Law was born in New Brunswick, Canada in 1858. His father, James Law, uh, who was from Port Rush, although maybe Coleraine could claim him as well. Um, he was a Presbyterian preacher and he emigrated to Canada in 1845 to become a Free Church of Scotland minister. Now, if I could just, uh, as an aside, say something about the Free Church of Scotland. It came into existence in 1843, in other words, just a couple of years before uh, James Law uh, took up the, the, the post in Canada. And it took, it, it, took um, it, it was a result of what was called the Great Disruption. Uh, and it was a split in the established Church of Scotland over the issue of state interference 
in the business of the church and in particular uh, local landlords choosing ministers and so on. And if those of you who saw the new King Charles pledging to uphold the independence of the Church of Scotland, um, in many ways, you know, that, that relates to that issue back at the Great Disruption about state interference in the business uh, of the Church of Scotland. And anyway, it's also perhaps a, quite interesting because uh, it shows that certainly over here in, in Ireland, uh, the Presbyterian Church uh, sided with the Free Church of Scotland. They, they became sister churches in effect. So th this helps to explain why uh, he became a, a Free Church of Scotland minister over in New Brunswick. Um, Andrew Bonnerlaw, he was the fourth uh, child of uh, James Law and uh, Catherine Kidson. Uh, his mother died when Bonnerlaw was only two years old. So he had no real memory of his mother. And he was sent back to Scotland to uh, live with uh, relatives or from his mother's side of the family. So he lived in Helensborough, um, a quite prosperous town in Dumbartonshire, not far from Glasgow. And uh, he went to school in the, Gla at the Glasgow High School. And this was an institution of some repute. It actually produced two prime ministers, uh, Bonner Law and Henry Campbell Bannerman, who became liberal prime minister in 1906. Um, Bonner Law also, I think, seems to have developed a lifelong interest in chess at uh, school, at the Glasgow High School. Uh, he became an outstanding chess player. And uh, chess and bridge, I think, were his two uh, main recreations right throughout his life. And um, maybe that expertise, maybe that excellence at chess um, said something about his shrewd tactical brain, which, which would later on be shown in the political arena to some effect. And um, when in Scotland, uh, as he was growing up, um, he, he certainly would have mixed uh, with uh, people in the industrial and business community he was to become an iron trader uh, in, in Glasgow. Um, his father moved back from Canada in 1877 and he, he lived in uh, Coleraine uh, until, or Port Rush, uh, until 1882. And each weekend in that five year period, uh, Andrew Bonnerlaw would sail from Scotland uh, to visit his father. Uh, on the North Coast. Um, and that, I think, says quite a lot about uh, the value that he put on family, on family uh, roots and the roots in Ulster and so on. Um, and I think, um, you know, growing up uh, or reaching adulthood in Scotland, mixing with, as I say, people in the industrial and business circles in Glasgow in the west of Scotland, and also coming back frequently to Ulster. I think he had a good understanding of um, life in Ulster about its political dis disposition and uh, temper. Um, and he was also no doubt aware of the great many affinities between the two places, um, talking of Glasgow in the west of Scotland and Ulster. I mean, these, these were places with similar heavy industry economies in, in this period places with religious tensions. There was a, there was a lot of uh, uh, echoes of Ireland in the west of Scotland in particular. Um, and of course, there was historical and cultural connections between the two places that dated back centuries. And there had always been a toing and froing of peoples between uh, the two places. Um, in late 19th century, there were quite a lot of Scots who were prominent in the business, commercial and industrial life of Belfast. Yes. Yes. And in Scotland, there were Ulstermen yes. who had made their uh, mark in yes. their chosen fields. Yes. For example, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, mm. 
and uh, Thomas Lipton in science, in the field of science, and Thomas Lipton in the field of retail. So there was a great deal of interaction uh, between Ulster and Scotland, and, uh, and Bonner Law, to, to some extent, uh, typified it or exemplified it. Um, so he, he was in Glasgow then, uh, as I say, uh, an iron trader, um, making a name for himself, I suppose, in business circles, but also uh, getting involved or, or getting interested anyway in, in the politics of the day. He, he apparently joined uh, debating societies and so on. He became a convinced conservative and um, he was adopted as a candidate for the general election for the seat of Glasgow Blackfriars in the general election of 1900. Now, in a way, this wasn't really a promising seat for Bonner Law. Um, it was a largely working class uh, seat. So for, it was a big challenge for a conservative to, to win it. Um, but two things were in his favor. One that it was that this was a khaki election, so-called. Uh, the election that took place in the context of the Boer War. And there was a great wave of patriotic feeling. Glasgow, of course, was known as the second city of the empire. So there was a great deal of that uh, going on at the time and fed into the election. Um, and secondly, the Liberal Party was uh, split over uh, the Boer War, the conduct of the war. So uh, Bonner Law uh, defied the odds. He won the seat. Um, and his political career then began. Um, so he goes into politics and he makes, I think, a fairly uh, pro positive impact at Westminster. Uh, he was a no frill speaker. Um, you know, uh, he never, I suppose, uh, got a reputation for any flowery speeches or anything like that, quite the opposite. He, he was a straight, blunt talker, but um, obviously uh, made an impact in many ways, became a parliamentary secretary at the Board of Trade quite early on. Um, and it should also be said that uh, he was an acolyte of Joseph Chamberlain, so therefore he was a tariff reformer. And tariff reform, of course, was one of the big issues of the day. But it was an issue which divided uh, the, the Conservative Party, those in favour of Chamberlain's uh, tariff reform project, uh, others who, who wished to, to stick with, with free trade and, or free food, as it, as it was uh, said at the time uh, in these debates. Um, Bonner Law lost his seat in 1906, but a, a, a safe seat was then found for him so that he could get back into the House of Commons quickly. And that, again, I think is a measure of how he had become uh, viewed in the Conservative Party as a real asset, as, as somebody that, um, you know, was, was perhaps going places. Um, so we, we have him then in the, at Westminster um, advancing, I think it's fair to say, in the Conservative Party, being talked about. Um, tragedy strikes, however, in 1909 when his wife dies. They had married in 1891. They had six children. Um, and uh, it's something I, I don't think that Bonner Law ever really got over. Um, and but it's been suggested, I think probably correctly, that uh, he he, foc he coped by focusing uh, on politics or throwing himself into politics. Um, people have questioned how ambitious he was and so on, but there's no doubt, I think, from this point on, uh, that he he is ambitious. He he wants to get he wants to to rise to the top. Um, and rise to the top, uh, he did. He became. Uh, conservative leader in 1911. Now, this was a, again a bit of a surprise. Uh, in some ways, he, he he got the leadership because he was a compromised candidate. Um, the the two main front runners at the time, Austin Chamberlain and Walter Long, um, divided opinion 
in the party and, and Bonner Law, in a sense, became the acceptable alternative. Um, also, I think there was a quite key role played by his friend, Max Aiken, a fellow Canadian uh, Lord, who became Lord Breverbrook, and of course, a, new, a newspaper baron. And uh, he, he was a great friend and uh, helper of Bonner Law throughout his political career. Um, Aiken or Beaverbrook uh, was a very colourful character, had a, a whole range of connections and so on, was able to oil the wheels for, for Bonner Law at different points in his career. And I think this is one of them. I think that um, Beaverbrook was, was busy behind the scenes in terms of, of getting Bonner Law uh, the leadership in the Conservative Party. And uh, the Conservatives needed a new leader because uh, Arthur Balfour, who had led the party um, for some years, um, had rather proved himself unable to win elections. Uh, but quite apart from that, he seemed to have a very languid Olympian sort of distant manner, which at this stage, you know, was felt to be, uh, you know, inadequate when it came to uh, regalvanizing the Conservatives. Because the party was not in a good state when Bonner Law became uh, leader in 1911. Now, he's a bit of an outsider figure. Um, he's a middle-class Presbyterian leading the party of the landed gentry and the established Anglican Church of England. So that's quite significant in itself. Um, but I think the party's ready for something new. Um, there were two general elections. They had lost, of course, in 1906 by a landslide. L Liberal got back in a complete landslide in 1906. The Tory party reduced to, to 150 odd seats. Um, in uh, 1910, there were two general elections, one at the beginning of the year, one at the end. Um, and in both of these elections, the outcome was, was too close to call between the Conservatives and Liberal Party. But Liberals held, the Liberals held on to office by virtue of the support given in the House of Commons by the Irish Parliamentary Party, those Irish uh, MPs uh, who had been, uh, since the days of Parnell back in the 1880s, uh, a presence in the House of Commons uh, pushing for a measure of Irish home rule. So the Liberals then um, were willing to uh, grant this uh, measure of Irish home rule in return for the support of the Irish parties, uh, the Irish MPs, so that they could continue to govern. Because the main Liberal uh, objective was to pass what became known as the Parliament Act in 1911. Now, the, the Parliament Act uh, set a, a, what was designed to uh, curb the veto power of the House of Lords. So therefore, it was a, an important constitutional change. And the reason for this was that back in 1909, when the Liberal Party and Lloyd George as Chancellor was, was trying to push through their people's budget, as it was called, and uh, was arousing all sorts of fury from landed interests and, and privileged interests. Uh, the House of Lords stymied this bill for some time, made it extremely difficult for this measure to get through. Now, this was a, a, a seen by the Liberals as a breach of parliamentary convention. Um, the House of Lords was, was uh, not supposed to actually interfere when it came to money bills. Um, but this time they did, they made life very difficult. So the Liberals um, decided upon this constitutional change so that the uh, House of Lords could only delay legislation in future, that once uh, a bill had passed through its third reading in the House of Commons, it would become law. The, the House of Lords could not stand in the way of it. So this was a very important change. Um, it was, I suppose, it was an adjustment to the constitutional balance. And from the conservative point of view, um, this was uh, an athlete. Um, they, they believed that this really was uh, subverting the constitution, that it was throwing the constitution out of balance. 
Um, and not only that, uh, the Liberals were actually doing this as part of a corrupt parliamentary bargain with the Irish party. Um, so the Conservatives then um, felt that it was the Liberals who were, in a sense, um, uh, playing games with the Constitution at this point. Um, and uh, they also, of course, uh, were against what the Liberals uh, had signed up for um, in doing this, namely uh, the uh, proceeding with the bill for Irish Home Rule. So I want to come on to uh, the, the Irish Home Rule question because uh, this issue is the one um, that certainly um, preoccupied Bonner Law um, most uh, in those, in, certainly in these years and in years to come. And it's also uh, the issue that uh, is most commented upon in relation to Bonner Law and his political career. And um, when he became leader, um, Bonner Law was, was cognizant of uh, divisions in the party over tariff reform and so on, was determined to try and keep the party together. And uh, he undoubtedly saw opposition to Irish Home Rule um, a, as a cause which could unite the party. Um, and also something that he, he thought um, would be a, a winner in the country. And Bonalaw was always asking for this issue to be put to an election. He felt that the 1910 elections, it had not been made explicit that this was going to happen. Um, and therefore, people had been, in a sense, duped, um, uh, or certainly the, the truth of, of what was happening was concealed from them, or what liberals intended to do was concealed from them. So he, he, was, all, he was consistent about this. He said he always wanted to, it to go to an election. Um, and he felt that, uh, you know, by, by hammering away at this issue that he, he could um, uh, unnerve the Liberal Party or certainly um, put pressure on them to, to go to the, the, the country. Um, and he, he was confident that if an election was fought on that basis, then the, the Conservatives could win. Um, quite apart from that, um, Bonner Law was uh, passionately opposed to Irish Home Rule in, in relation to the uh, question of Ulster and uh, Ulster's uh, demand uh, to, to be uh, excluded from this. Um, Bonalaw obviously through his family connections and so on understood better, I think, than, than any of the else. Uh, at Westminster and the political class, the strength and depth of feeling uh, in Ulster, in the, in the Protestant community in Ulster, um, about Irish Home Rule, their fears about Irish Home Rule. Um, th these took several forms. I, I think, you know, the, the most important were religious fears, uh, the idea that an Irish uh, parliament in Dublin would be unduly influenced by the Catholic Church, the, the vast majority of members of it would be Catholic, um, and fears therefore that, that Protestants would, would get a raw deal in any kind of uh, home rule Ireland. So the, there was, um, religion played a big part in this. There was also fears about the economy, the, the economic effects of Irish home rule. Um, there were fears about perhaps the attenuation of uh, British citizenship and identity that was held by uh, the majority, uh, pr the Protestant community in the, the North uh, or in, in Ulster as a whole. Um, so Bonner Law uh, shared these, uh, these feelings to a great extent. Uh, certainly the, the religious objection, he said it on numerous occasions. Uh, it doesn't seem that it, it's you know, Bonner Law was a man of devout faith, but nonetheless, he, he was very aware and very proud of his family roots and his father's Presbyterian uh, ministry, etc. So um, the religious uh, aspect did mean something uh, to Bonner Law. And 
in these pre-First World War years, as the crisis developed around Irish Home Rule, the, the Liberal government brought in a bill uh, in 1912. Um, Bonner Law and Edward Carson, who had been elected the leader of the Irish Unionists, um, fronted up the opposition to this uh, bill and um, were, of course, the central figures in uh, the, res the, the, the sort of resistance uh, in Ulster itself uh, to, uh, to Irish Home Rule. Now, um, there were Protestants in other parts of Ireland as well, but they were, they were scattered around and um, they did not have the community cohesion, the concentration of numbers and so on that there were in Ulster. So rather inevitably, I think, the opposition to Irish Home Rule became concentrated in Ulster. And the question of whether um, some uh, solution could be found which excluded Ulster from uh, the Irish Home Rule Bill, this, this was very much in the air from about 1911, 1912. Um, uh, Edward Carson wanted, I think, to use the Ulster objections and the, the Ulster case to try and scupper our Home Rule entirely. Border law, I think, was was his priority was simply to get Ulster excluded, to make sure that Ulster was not part of any uh, or not put under any Dublin Parliament that might come about. Um, so the two men, I, I think, were somewhat different there. Carson, of course, being a Dubliner, uh, did have this all Ireland Unionist uh, mindset. Although, of course, he, even he had to recognise that um, the real uh, resistance was going to be found uh, in Ulster. So it's a period of high drama, of course. Um, Bonner Law has been accused of uh, inciting rebellion and, and treason uh, in some of the things that he was saying uh, in this period. Um, certainly some of the, the speeches, perhaps the most notable ones are Balmoral, uh, in, in Belfast in, in 1912. Um, and if I could just refer a wee bit to, to that speech, because the language that he uses, uh, I think it is very interesting indeed. Um, and again, shows his affinity with, with Ulster um, uh, loyalists and uh, Protestants. Um, at Balmoral, um, Bonner Law uh, told his audience that uh, the cause was not Ulster's alone, but that of the empire. Once again, you hold the past, the past for the empire. You are a besieged city. The timid have left you. Your Lundies have betrayed you. But you have closed your gates. The government have erected by their Parliament Act a boom against you to shut you off from the help of the British people. You will bust that boom. The help will come. And when the crisis is over, men will say to you in words not unlike those used by Pitt, you have saved yourself by your exertions and you will save the empire by your example. Now, that language about the, the besieged city, the boom and so on, that consciously invoked the siege of Derry. So Bonner Law was very conscious of, of what moved his audience and very deliberately used historical references such as that to, 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 to play to his followers and so on. But again, you know, Bonner Law would have justified his, his actions by saying that, you know, th this was the Liberals acting fast and loose with the Constitution. Um, when the Parliament Act of 1911 that I've been, just mentioned uh, w w was being debated in Parliament, Bonner Law referred to it as the Irish Home Rule Bill in Disguise Bill. So he, he felt that, you know, the Liberals were smuggling in Home Rule through the Parliament Act um, and that this justified the kind of um, strident opposition that he and Carson uh, were, were offering. Um, later in 1912 at Blenheim Palace, he made the, the famous declaration that he could foresee no lengths in that Ulster could go, that he would not support them. And there were things, um, you know, of more account than parliamentary majority. Now, th this was dangerous stuff, no doubt about it. The, the oratory was highly inflammatory. Um, I'd say two things about this. 
when, uh, in relation to, to that notion about Bonner Law and Carson and, and playing with fire, if you like, in, in that period. Um, the first one, the first point I would make is that I think Bonner Law and Carson were very uh, intent on staying in front of their followers, if I can put it like that. They were very conscious that things could get out of hand. They understood the depth of feeling in Ulster. Um, they knew that Ulster was not bluffing. Many people in Britain, uh, you know, some news, liberal newspapers, liberal politicians and others, um, took the view that this was all bluster. Um, did, did not really take this seriously, called it a pantomime and so on and so forth. Um, Bonnerlaw and Carson, I think, realized that, that that was hugely mistaken, that these people were in earnest. Um, and they felt, I think, that they had to sound militant so that they didn't lose them, uh, so that uh, they would stop things getting out of hand. Because, uh, because privately, and this point, I think, has to be stressed, um, Bonnerlaw and Carson were making great efforts to try and find a solution uh, to, to the issue. Um, there, there were all sorts of meetings and uh, ideas been thrown around and so on about possible Ulster exclusion and so on, um, which dragged on um, I, and didn't get anywhere. And of course, the Liberals were having to try and keep the uh, Irish party uh, on board. Uh, while exploring these possibilities uh, with Bonner Law and Carson. But there was an awful lot going on behind the scenes in private. So what, what I'm saying to you is I think a lot of uh, what Bonner Law and Carson were trying to do in private um, was uh, very different, of course, to, to what they were uttering in public. Uh, and I think part of the reason anyway is that they, they just felt they, they had to stay in front of their support, supporters. Uh, not let their supporters feel that they, they were letting them down and so on, that they would have to take matters into their own hands. Now, the other point I would make is that um, the tensions that are building up in Ulster um, and the, the threats, the threats of violence, the um, uh, threats of resistance, um, the, the drilling, the, the marches, the big demonstrations and so on. All of that has to be put in the context of the wider picture in British society in the years before the First World War. Um, there was labour unrest, labour unrest which could spill over and did spill over into violence. Uh, there was the suffragettes and their violent tactics as well. It was a period where men and women appeared to uh, be prepared to make sacrifices for their respective causes, uh, to take risks. Um, it was a period of inflamed passions, um, of, of great uh, foreboding that uh, you know things were falling apart, that Britain was having some kind of nervous breakdown. Um, it's all uh, there in, in a classic text written uh, by the historian George Dangerfield, The Strange Death of Liberal England, uh, which, which actually was published back in the 1930s. And it's still a, a fantastic read today and captures the atmosphere of that, uh, the fervent the, the fervent atmosphere, um, feverish atmosphere of that time. Although it should be said that Dangerfield um, ha, has a very jaundiced view um, of, of the Unionist um, rebellion, as he calls it. So there is a lot going on. Uh, I think it's fair to say there's something in the air uh, in, the, in this period. And, and I don't think we can take um, out or, uh, the, the Ulster part of this and analyze it without reference uh, to other things that are going on. Um, it's a very uh, um, uh, intense political, uh, turbulent political period. Um, but it is the period where Bonner Law really makes his name. Um, he, through the oratory that I've mentioned, through his leadership with 
Carson and so on. He is playing a dangerous game. I think he knows that. But um, he does feel that this, he first of all feels that uh, this is an issue in which he is personally invested in. Um, it's something that means a lot to him. He's genuine. Secondly, it is an issue which, for from a political and tactical point of view, uh, he feels uh, it is going to, to get the Conservatives back into power. As I say, he was always looking for an election uh, on this issue, a change of government. Um, well, as uh, you all know, um, uh, the First World War intervened to, um, in effect, put this issue in cold storage. The Irish Home Rule Bill was put on the statute book, but was, was, the, its operation was suspended until after the war. And then after the war, the situation, of course, was very different. Um, now, the First World War, well, Bonner Law, I think, in the First World War uh, becomes, if you like, a statesman. Uh, from being this uh, political figure who was being scorned by, by many for, for his outbursts and his apparent calls to uh, resist the government and parliament and so on, um, there is a, a quick turnaround during the war to um, statesmanship. He becomes colonial secretary in 1915, but it's when Lloyd George takes over as prime minister uh, in 1916 that, that Bonner Law really comes to the fore. He, he becomes chancellor um, and he, in effect, finances the war effort that Lloyd George is, is managing and conducting uh, through a series of war loans and so on. He is generally seen as being a brilliant chancellor. Um, and um, he develops a very good working relationship with Lloyd George. Um, now, it should be said that uh, although many liberals were disdainful of uh, Bonner Law, and, and when he became conservative leader, uh, Asquith, the Prime Minister, was one such person who, who really sort of was very contemptuous of him. Um, but Bonner, uh, Lloyd George right away saw the qualities, I think, in Bonner Law. Uh, he is reported to have said that, uh, of the Tories when they elected them, the fools have stumbled across the right man by accident. Um, so... Lloyd George knew that this was a formidable figure. Um, and, and his admiration, I think, uh, had only grown in the intervening years. So he trusted him as chancellor and they developed a very, very good working relationship. Um, they complemented each other, it might be said. Lloyd George, you know, more colorful, gregarious and so on. Bonner Law, very stolid figure, but nonetheless, you know, it, I think Bonner Law's business brain was what was needed. Um, so it's in this period, uh, I think, that, that Bonner Law uh, distinguishes himself. Um, then as leader of the House of Commons in the years following the war in the path to peacetime reconstruction, uh, he also distinguishes himself. Uh, he, he had to manage the House of Commons in the absence, the frequent absence, uh, of, of Lloyd George. And this he did, I think, uh, to, to great effect. However, uh, there were uh, darkening clouds when it came to Bonner Law's health. Um, he was a very heavy smoker, and um, ultimately he got, the, it was throat cancer that, that killed him. And um, his health worsened uh, in, in this period, and he took retirement from politics uh, in, in March of 1921. Um, he came back into the political sphere, largely, I think, again, because of the Irish issue and Ulster. Um, 
what he feared, I think, it, it, when he came back at the end of 1921 was that Lloyd George, and of course, Bonner Law was, was uh, part of the coalition, the Conservatives were part of the Lloyd George coalition, uh, which had survived the war and won the 1918 election and uh, was in power. Um, and, and Bonner Law certainly wished that to continue. But by 1920, by the end of 1921, he was well aware that uh, many in his Conservative Party uh, were getting ready to ditch Lloyd George. And there was also a great deal of nervousness about Lloyd George's Irish, um, uh, or the way he was conducting the Irish question. Now, things had been transformed in Ireland. Um, after the First World War, uh, or during the First World War, with the Easter Rising uh, uh, and, and its aftermath, which, which changed the mood dramatically in Ireland. The mood swung away from the, the Irish Parliamentary Party and their demand for home rule. Uh, the mood hardened and the beneficiaries were Sinn Féin, who won a landslide election victory in 1918 on the, the platform of a fully independent republic. Um, so the mood had, had been transformed in Ireland. Then, then we have, from between 1919 and 21, the, the War of Independence uh, in Ireland. Um, and uh, amidst all this, the British government came up with uh, what is in effect a fourth Home Rule Bill, um, this time giving Home Rule parliaments to uh, the North, the six county North, the uh, Northern, the new Northern Ireland defined as the six counties of Antrim, Down, Armagh, uh, Fermanagh, Tyrone and uh, Londonderry. Um, now, uh, and another Home Rule Parliament to the rest of the country. Now this solution, and there was supp supposed to be a Council of Ireland in between that would bring them together uh, in the long term, uh, help them cooperate and so on and, and, and become one in effect. So this, this is why I think it's called another Home Rule Bill, because ultimately this was, uh, again, an, a, an attempt to get Irish Home Rule, again, still within the United Kingdom. But it had no chance of being implemented in uh, outside of the new Northern Ireland. Um, the, the desire for, for, a, for something much more substantial will, will, had swept the country. So there was no way that the Government of Ireland Act actually could be implemented in the south of Ireland, but it was implemented in Northern Ireland and, and the Unionist leaders there quickly set up the new uh, political entity there, uh, the devolved, with the devolved institutions and so on. And this of course was the UK's first uh, example of devolved government. We have devolved government today in Scotland and Wales and occasionally in Northern Ireland. But um, we, this, this is a first example, historically. Um, now, for Bonner Law, uh, that was success. Uh, it may not have been perfect, but Northern Ireland being uh, excluded from any other arrangement in Ireland, uh, was for him a success. It, it, he he felt that you know that 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 would that would in a sense of uh, uh, you know meet his his deepest wishes. Um, but towards the end of 1921, when Lloyd George is negotiating with with Irish Republicans and so on, um, a lot of Conservatives, including Bonalow, get very nervous that. Northern Ireland is going to be thrown back into the mix. There's going to be a revised settlement. Um, and that Northern Ireland is again going to be forced uh, under a Dublin parliament. Um, this doesn't happen. Uh, the Treaty of December 1921 um, uh, ensures uh, that Northern Ireland uh, has a right to opt out of the what was to become uh, an all-Ireland uh, state, um, but there was supposed to be a boundary commission uh, that would decide on 
redrawing the border, which, which again worried unionists until it, the, the issue was finally settled uh, in 1925. But certainly Bonner Law um, was attracted back into the political arena because he, he was somewhat concerned uh, that uh, Northern Ireland could be sacrificed. And again, you know, he, he was relieved, much relieved, uh, when, when this didn't turn out to be the case. Now, he became Prime Minister, and I'll, I'll rush through this now because I, I'm conscious that we're getting on quite a bit of time. Uh, he became Prime Minister um, when he was still pretty, pretty ill and uh, not really up to it. Uh, it was October 1922, nearly a century ago. Um, his premiership, I think, doesn't, it, it, there's not much, I think, that can be said about it. He, he lost out in cabinet to, around the, the payment of the repayment of the war debt to America and so on, which, which took the gloss off, I think, the, the short time that he was in his uh, 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 office as prime minister. Um, i just say about his style, he, he was a collegial, collegial uh, type of prime minister, a chairman rather than a presidential type, you might say. Um, he cajoled colleagues uh, along. He understood that people had talents and so on, and he wanted to fuse them as much as he could. Um, there was also, uh, the, you know, he apparently, the, there are some parallels with Clement Attlee here. Attlee had that same style when he was prime minister. And I was looking through Hugh Gateskill's diaries fairly recently, and he was commenting on, on Attlee's style and his use of silence in meetings so that, you know, if, if there was a potentially awkward meeting with somebody, Attlee would generally try and frustrate that person, you know, with, with long silences. And uh, Gateskill said that Bonner Law was known for this as well. So, um, I, you know, I, I think that's quite interesting. Somebody um, uh, like Bonner Law, uh, it wouldn't have bothered him one bit to, to sit in silence. And, and I think he, he probably did use it as a political ploy uh, from time to time. So, so his style was low key, um, uh, but the, the, uh, there was not enough time to actually achieve anything particularly lasting. Uh, so his ill health, uh, his throat cancer, um, uh, um, forced him out, uh, forced him to, to retire in May of 1923, and he was dead a few months later. Um, okay, I, I think um, I'll probably leave it there. I mean, he, we could speculate, I think, on had he lived a bit longer, what he might have done, um, maybe in relation to Northern Ireland and so on. Um, I think that it, it, there isn't an awful lot to say about his actual premiership, but of course there's an awful lot we can say about his earlier career, and it is a highly significant career. So I'll leave it there, and I'll, I'll welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Graham. Um, in terms of questions, if members do have questions on uh, Graham's talk, if you can either indicate on the chat or put your hand up, I will then bring you in uh, for a question. So if anybody's any questions, but I'll, I'll kick it off um, uh, with Graham. Um, what do you think um, is his defining legacy as premiership or as leader of the Conservative Party? Um, I know today um, his legacy is still felt with the 1922 committee and um, he was the first leader of the Conservative Party to come from a non-gentry, landed gentry background. So do you think his greatest legacy is the way he shaped the Conservative Party during his time or was it the actions he had done? Yes, uh, I think you could make a case for saying that uh, he helped the Conservative Party move into the more modern age. Um, made it appeal to people, certainly of his background and so on. Um, also, I think that he was somebody who was well aware of, of that strain of working class conservatism, which existed in uh, parts of Britain and uh, how that had to be cultivated and so on. Um, so he was somebody who definitely 
it made sure that the party's focus was not just on wealthy, the wealthy in society and so on, uh, and that it was a party which could adapt, could change. Um, the Conservative Party, I suppose, has always been seen uh, as having a, a kind of political genius for uh, adapting to the times and so on. And there's a sense in which, you know, Bonner Law typifies that. So, yes, I, I think you're right. He, he was adamant about party unity and so on. He, he, he I think, would, he would not have admired leaders who took risks with party unity um, and who, uh, who perhaps peddled or, or rode their own hobby horses, shall we say, to the expense of party unity. Let, let me put it that way. It'll be interesting uh, they know what he would make of Liz Truss's current premiership. I think he would have a pretty sharp view on the way she has started her premiership so far. Um, has any members got any questions they would like to ask on the talk? I'm saying it's all silence at the moment. I have a question, Richard what? Ted. I wonder, he seems to be on the wrong side of history with regard to tariffs and free trade. Did he change his mind on that later in his uh, career? Um, uh, <laughs> I don't think he did. <laughs> well, he, may, he certainly modified his views, shall we say. But um, uh, again, it, it was something that he didn't want to, to the Conservative Party to be tearing itself apart on. And he was prepared to, to make uh, sacrifices on it. Uh, he, he, um, when he became leader, he sort of diffused the issue. Um, I, I'm not too clear. I don't think the biographies are too clear on whether his views changed much after that. Um, the, the most recent biography by, by a man called Quincy Adams, a uh, very good political biography of Bonner Law, doesn't really say very much about that. So I, I must say I'm a bit in the dark. It's a very good question. I, I think somebody maybe ought to uh, follow it up. But I think he, he was so preoccupied with Ulster um, and so preoccupied with the Irish issue and the constitutional matters that it, it, the tariff reform just kind of faded away. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else want to ask a question before I uh, thank our speaker? Take the science as uh, that's everybody's happy uh, not asking the question. Um, can I uh, thank uh, Graham for his insightful talk tonight on Bonner Law? Hopefully it has given members an insight into who Bonner Law was uh, and the reason why uh, we're recognizing him in co Um He was a significant political figure. His uh, tenure as premiership was quite short, but he did have a long political career and he did a lot of important things during that time. So Graham, thank you for the very interesting and insightful talk and to Bonner Law, who was his career and also his connections to Ulster. Um, and thank you members for attending the talk. I know it's on Zoom tonight. Um, and thank you for your uh, indulgence and attention tonight on this talk. Amory, do you want to add anything? 